Hi everyone, um, welcome to our occasional lecture series. Yanni's going to introduce the speaker, but just for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Joshua Tucker, I'm the director of the Jordan Center, and I would just like to remind you, if you're excited about our exciting programming today, and you're not already on our email list, we have an email sign-up sheet here, um, where you can be informed of all of our programming and take advantage of our amazing All the Russia's blog. I also wanted to make a quick just uh, push, if you haven't RSVP'd already, we have this brand new Carnegie-sponsored um, Russia, New York City Russia Public Policy Series. Uh, we're, we're doing it joint with Harriman at Columbia, and we had the first meeting of the series uh, last month up at Columbia. We talked about the reset, and we're going to be having our first meeting here at NYU. Uh, we'll be on Thursday at 5 o'clock. I uh, hope to see as many of you there as possible. We are trying to get RSVPs, so RSVP if you haven't. It's going to be on Compromat. Uh, what it is, how it's used in politics, what's going on with it these days, and about technology in Compromat and how technology has changed Compromat from the KGB days and what's different about it now. So should be a big event. We've gotten a really nice uh, RCP list for it already, so hopefully maybe you can make it there. That's the announcements. I'm going to turn it over to Yanni to introduce Thank you, our speaker today. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we're introducing today uh, Kostadinos Katsakiotis, who is a graduate of the, was it Paris or was it the Ecole des Institutes? I graduated in Naples at the University of Athens, uh -huh. and then my, I went to France for my master and PhD. At Ecole des Etudes. Ecole des Etudes, that's what I thought. Um, and um, having finished that, he's moved on now to uh, Bayoit, the, the, uh, an institute for African studies in this case, right? Um, so he does both. What I wanted to mention was that he's done amazing research in the archives in um, the former Soviet Union uh, on a variety of higher education institutions. Uh, including in this case the Patricio Mumbai University, which is sort of emblematic of the outreach to, um, um, well, Africa in this case, for, for the most part, but it was more than that, I think, as, as he's going to be telling us. Um, and it's a real treat to listen to him speak because it's based on such a solid uh, and uh, uh, voluminous uh, uh, archival base. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, please, for your thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and this invitation. I'm really glad to, uh, to join the Jordan Center again. I was among the first uh, um, uh, scholars who came here when the, uh, the, the center was inaugurated. Uh, so it's the second time I give a talk. And the first one, uh, well, I, I was very lucky because the paper uh, will be published in Critica. And I hope that this paper too will be published. And I will, of course, uh, express my gratitude to the center. Um, mm -hmm. So this paper now it is about the Patrice Lumumba um, University, People's Friendship University, uh, uh, founded in 1960 uh, in Moscow, and uh, uh, rechristened Patrice Lumumba um, uh, in 1961, the following year. It is a spin-off uh, uh, from my uh, research, which is uh, generally on uh, the education, the cultural and educational cooperation between um, the Soviet Union and uh, the post-colonial countries of Asia and Africa. Um, and uh, um, to introduce you to uh, this broader topic, I would like to say that um, this cooperation is a very important uh, chapter uh, of, um, um, of the relations between uh, the East and the South, the, the Second World and the Third World, uh, the educational cooperation. It is also a forgotten chapter. Um, if there have not been scholars such as uh, Maxim Matusevich uh, or Rosin Tsiakalov who <coughs> have written on these topics, uh, um, so otherwise uh, um, uh, there has not been um, so much research done. Uh, but I try to convince you uh, with these uh, tables, first of all. Uh, here you can see the number of uh, African students studying in different, uh, in most countries of uh, um, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, so you see that in 1967, for example, there were 9,000 students uh, from uh, the entire African continent, not only from Sub-Saharan Africa. So 5,000 uh, in the USSR and almost 4,000 in the rest of uh, um, the countries uh, of uh, uh, the, the bloc. Huh? Um, uh, so the, the second war uh, was, uh, um, um, uh, was an area where many students from uh, African, Asian, and uh, Latin American countries studied. And now let's go to move to another table. Uh, here you see the uh, aggregate data on uh, students from Sub-Saharan Africa only, uh, studying in the major host countries in 1962, 68, 78, 88, and 90. So you will see that um, in 62 there were only 
uh, 1,000 students in uh, the Soviet Union only, uh, so much less than in France and in the US. Um, then in 68, um, you have 4,000 students. In 78, um, almost 10,000 students from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and well, But you see that already the Soviet Union is the third uh, major uh, host uh, country for students from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it has even surpassed the UK, which was a colonial uh, power and which was training students uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then in 19, 1988, you have 21, almost 21,000 uh, students from Sub-Saharan Africa and the Soviet Union. It's amazing. You, you see that there are more students from Africa in the Soviet Union than uh, in the United States. So the Soviet Union uh, became the second uh, major uh, host country for students from Sub-Saharan Africa. And even uh, just a, a, a couple of months before the, the dismantlement of the Soviet Union, you had 20, almost 24,000 students from Sub-Saharan Africa. The overwhelming majority of these students studied with scholarships uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, so a small comment uh, for the USA from the US. Um, if you see the numbers, uh, the data um, provided by the Institute uh, of International Education here in New York, which is based in New York, you will see that um, they are um, <coughs> bigger, 20% uh, or 30% bigger. But attention, because they include also um, those who studied military academies. So I use the data of UNESCO and then the data from the Soviet archives. So these are approximate. It's, in, it's an approximate comparative table. So this is to convince you that uh, indeed it was, uh, it was a very important um, uh, thing that happened between this educational cooperation between Africa uh, and between uh, the Third World and uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and besides the students studying in the Soviet Union, there were also uh, Soviet professors who went to African countries, uh, to Asian countries, for technical schools created all over the world, etc., etc. So the cooperation is uh, very important. Um, so these years from, roughly speaking, from uh, decolonization in the late uh, 50s and early 60s, um, so until the end of the Cold War, um, is the period that um, started, of course, with uh, um, the independence of many countries and uh, um, the, um, uh, the will to educate their national elites uh, who would uh, um, replace uh, uh, colonial administrators. Uh, so this was a request of many post-colonial countries. Uh, uh, there was a very important conference that took place in Addis Ababa in '61, and uh, the heads of state, states, and the ministers of education uh, uh, of African countries stated that it is our aspiration. We want to sacrifice uh, to uh, uh, to attain the means for gaining economic and social development. So education was very central. Um, and this entire period, it is a period that sociologists of education um, have labeled um, the World Educational Revolution. It was a debate in the Comparative uh, Education Review, a journal created also in 1959. So this World Educational Revolution, uh, the period that Immanuel Wall Wallerstein characterized, for which he said that we must the culmination of the Enlightenment promise for progress to education. Okay, so this educational aid uh, is in this picture. And the Soviet Union um, um, played its role. So this is the conclusion from the introduction. <laughs> now, before um, uh, starting um, recounting the story of the Patrice de Mumbai University, which was created in 1960, um, I will invite you for a very short uh, uh, detour uh, through the French Empire. Uh, the French Empire, December. Uh, 1959, uh, just um, um, two months before uh, Khrushchev announced uh, the creation of uh, the Lumumba University. And you will see how relevant it is for the Lumumba University. So in December, um, in December uh, 14, uh, on December 14, 21, 1959, uh, a very important conference uh, took place uh, in the French Empire. It was still the French Empire. Um, uh, first in Dakar, Senegal, and then in Abidjan. The, the, the theme of the conference was the scientific and technical research and the economic and social development of African countries. 
uh, almost uh, 200 uh, French uh, scholars, very important scholars, uh, they, most of them came, uh, went to Africa from France, and together with African politicians and uh, um, educated elites, uh, uh, they, they participated in this conference, which lasted one week. Uh, on December 17, uh, Charles de Gaulle was there. So the conference was at the Dakar University. The venue was Dakar University. Charles de Gaulle was at the General Assembly. And it was at that moment that he announced that, uh, OK, Senegal and Mali are, are allowed to get out of the French Empire while remaining members of the community. So it was um, the dissolution of the French Empire, which is described in uh, the last book of uh, Professor Frederick Cooper. So he mentioned this event. Um, he mentioned this event. So, so it was a very important moment. And it was not by chance that there was also this conference. OK, now the countries are uh, gaining independence. What are we going to do? So who will rule these countries? Uh, who, who are the people that who, who will uh, manage the affairs of the countries? Uh, it was very important. Uh, the conference was organized by Henri Logier. Uh, Henri Logier was the first director of uh, uh, the CNRS, the French uh, National Research Institute uh, in Paris, where you were last week, uh, last month. <laughs> um, so he was a very influential person. Um, he was also the director of the Paris Institute for the Study of uh, Economic and Social Development, and the founder of uh, the very important French review, uh, Thierry Monde, the Third World. What all this has to do with Lumumba University? So I mention this to, to show you how important it was at that time of independence uh, to create education institutions and to bring people to be educated there, because we had in mind that those people will rule the, their countries uh, in the post-colonial times. So in that conference, the debate uh, got very heated. And um, Henri Rosier, together with the economist George Fisher, uh, um, they presented a paper in which they, they argued that Traditional French education is harmful for Africa. Instead, Africa needs centers for accelerated training, the introduction of shock pedagogies, and the goal, they said, would be to reach a Stahanovite pace of in educational activity. So this is the French idea, uh, much inspired by the, the very advertised uh, uh, Soviet model for increasing productivity. Um, In February, um, in February, or in, uh, yes, in February or in early March 1960, they published the paper. So, if you go uh, uh, in the internet and you see the first issue of this journal, the journal uh, Thierry Monde, Third World, the first issue, uh, the first paper, is entitled "Pour une université internationale au service des pays sous-développés" for an international university in the service of underdeveloped countries. So, this was the important thing to do at that time, to create an international university, said the French. So this would be a university only for the third world, to develop the third world and to have some Stahanovite uh, ideas. Uh, eventually, um, they developed the, the, the idea in the paper. And they said that Africa needs its own intellectual, scientific, and technical experts capable to assume responsibility for their country's destinies as quickly as possible. Right now, we have to make a university to invite people from the post-colonial countries, from our empire, to educate them. Uh, when we were ruling the empire, we, we didn't bother educating them. You know, the University of Dakar uh, opened its doors uh, a couple of weeks before this conference. So it was the first university in Africa uh, with the status of a metropolitan university. There were other schools, however. So, but which was the problem? They had this idea. This very nice idea. The reactions of African politicians to these ideas, they wrote Lucien and Fischer in, in their paper. Most of them, the African politicians, reject with more or less indignation and always firmly every special training institution which may be suited to their situation. All such kind of uh, training is dismissed as low quality education, tailor made training and is considered as an intolerable reminiscence of the old relations between colonizers and colonized. So Africans didn't like the idea of Lozier and Fisher. They said, what, what do they want? They want to create a special university now for the post-colonial countries. It will be something like a colonial university. So there was 
uh, there was resistance to this idea. They, they didn't want it. They want to be uh, in the same universities as French students, simply. Otherwise, it was a discrimination in their eyes, and they were absolutely right. Okay. So I, I don't want to comment so much. We can discuss uh, all these, uh, you know, ideas of the North to educate the South, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it also has to do with Lumumba University. So the idea of the French idea was uh, somehow uh, vindicated in the Soviet Union, where this approach of modernization through Swedish education was also the same. It was the same idea with the Soviets. The Soviets had this idea, and the creation of the Patrice Lumumba University, when Khrushchev announced that this university will be created, he announced this in uh, February 1960. So he has the same discourse. So he has the same ideas in mind. So the same, he thinks in the same way as the French. There is not a very big difference. Wishing to help the developing countries to trade their um, national manpower, engineers, etc., etc., specialists. The Soviet government has decided to create in Moscow a university for the uh, friendship of the people. So we need a co quotation from a paper of Rosen Zakalov. The difference was, of course, that um, Khrushchev added that the students who will come to this university uh, will be from uh, low-income families, from poor families. So this was not something that uh, Lozier and Fischer uh, had said. So the Soviets have, have also this uh, idea of uh, affirmative action. Um, And the University of uh, the People's Friendship University is created uh, after the announcement in Yog uh, Yogyakarta. So this was um, uh, this is um, an, uh, uh, part of the discourse of Nikita Khrushchev in Indonesia. He announced the creation of Lumumba University in Indonesia. All this happens in Dakar, Abidjan, Paris, Moscow, Indonesia, all over the world. So uh, it is uh, it is truly. Um, uh, something that takes place um, in, uh, at the international level. Um, uh, so these ideas that uh, education will bring modernization uh, are debated in Addis Ababa by Africans, in, uh, in, in Dakar by Africans and friends, elsewhere in all over the world in the forms of UNESCO. And of course, the Soviet Union is part of this dialogue. And they believe that they have something to bring. They have to co a contribution here. And the university, the People's Friendship University, is created in 1960. Um, and the Soviets, of course, believe that this idea um, will elicit the admiration and the gratitude from the, the post colonial countries. This is their belief. Uh, because uh, they will uh, invite people to study, they will pay scholarships, uh, uh, they will give the chance to people who don't have the opportunity to, to study um, in the Soviet Union. So the university, the People's Friendship University, uh, Patrice Lumumba, is created and it has uh, um, six faculties. Um, broadly speaking, from, 96, from uh, 1960, until 1990, this is the Soviet period, the Soviet era. Uh, I will stop. I, I will not uh, um, discuss the post-Soviet uh, um, uh, development of the, of the uh, university. So during this period, the annual uh, enrollment uh, was uh, 600 students. So if you break down this, it is uh, 125 students, 25 percent from Sub-Saharan Africa. 25% from North Africa and Middle East, uh, Maghreb, Algeria, um, Middle East, including uh, Cyprus. Um, then you have Asian students, but not from the socialist countries of Asia. Uh, you didn't have Chinese, you didn't have North Koreans, you didn't have Vietnamese, Mongolians. You only had students from India, from Sri Lanka, from, uh, from the third world, and not from the second world, let's say. 
And you had also Latin Americans. At the beginning, you had some Cubans. There were some Cubans at Lumumba University. Uh, but when Cuba uh, was promoted from uh, the third to the second war, uh, so Cubans uh, left the university. They were also troublemakers, so they preferred to uh, send them around the Soviet Union. Uh, so 600 students per year. If you remember the tables that I showed you earlier, here you see that um, Lumumba University was very important in the 60s uh, in terms of its recruitment. Then um, recruitment uh, of uh, African and third world students in the Soviet Union expanded, um, increased. Uh, so uh, the Lumumba uh, becomes uh, less significant in the 70s and in the 80s. <clears throat> but the triumph of the Soviets uh, did not last very long. Everything was great when the university opened its doors uh, at the beginning, but there were reactions immediately. Uh, there were reactions um, from foreign governments, uh, reactions of students, um, and they used many arguments against the Lumumba University. For instance, um, a student from Togo wrote that it is a, he wrote a book um, in which uh, he states that uh, it was an institution created to segregate students. Uh, a Liberian, William Appleton, wrote a book uh, in which he called the university a student trap. Somali students who left the Soviet Union um, wrote uh, a leaflet together with the Italian embassy. Um, the leaflet um, is entitled, The Communists Speak, The Africans Reply, Ten Truths About the People's Friendship University in Moscow. Another African, Nigerian, uh, published a paper entitled, In Moscow They Trained Me to Organize Revolutions in Africa. The triumph of the Soviets didn't last very long. Um, there were many reactions against the university, and because of these reactions, these reactions were uh, seen in London, uh, and in a report of the colonial office, it was still named the British Colonial Office, an official wrote that uh, this is the British assessment of the Lumumba University. The establishment of a kind of African ghetto in the form of Lumumba University has clearly been an error. So the British are very glad when they see that the Soviets have troubles with this university. Uh, they say, oh, the guys just made an error. So the French didn't make the error. The Soviets made the error to create a university which everybody believes that it is a ghetto. And even the African students say things like that. It was not a ghetto. It was not a ghetto at all. Huh? Because at the same time, there were students all over the Soviet Union. Uh, there were not only at Patrick Lumumba University. But the reactions continued, especially when, um, you know, when the news circulated that uh, grad not graduate students who had spent only some months uh, apart yet uh, the Lumumba University, uh, such as uh, Rohana Vizesveira, uh, who, who led the uh, revolution against the government of Sri, of Sri Lanka. He was student at Lumumba University. Then uh, Carlos Ramirez Sanchez, who uh, committed uh, terrorist crimes. He was also student at Patrice Lumumba University for a short period. I tried to find him in the archives. Uh, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. um, In the 70s, um, these two names are, you know, uh, you can read in the newspapers that this person studied at Lumumba University, so it is not, it is, it's not good for the reputation of the university. And in the 80s, of course, you have other uh, 
reactions against Lumumba University, for example, um, there is often a parallel between uh, Lumumba University in Moscow and the Qom University in Iran, where the radical clerics uh, were educated, those uh, who uh, were very prominent in the Iranian revolution. So it is basically in Western newspapers, in the CIA, that draws this parallel between Qom University in Iran and Lumumba University in Moscow. And later in the post-Soviet uh, uh, era, you, you still have uh, many uh, uh, representations of the Lumumba University, among others, in the novels of uh, the Chilean novelist uh, Luis uh, Sepulveda, who was a student in the Soviet Union for one year, and he wrote a book in which he, um, uh, he describes the Lumumba University as, uh, uh, as a place where Latin American communists were studying, but he compares this to the Moscow State University, and he, he, he argues that it was, uh, it was not as privileged, not as good. So let me ask a couple of questions now. Why all these reactions against the People's Friendship University? Uh, which were the specific uh, features of Lumumba University in comparison with regular Soviet schools? Were the reactions justified against the university, or all this was Western anti-Soviet propaganda? How did they affect the university? And I will also try to assess the university first as an education institution and then as a cultural, as an undertaking of cultural policy, because it was, of course, an idea uh, uh, that was meant to foster the friends between the Third World and the Soviet Union. So did it work as a cultural policy or not? And was it a good university? After all, this is the most important. So the specific features of the university, first it was reserved to students from the Third World. At the beginning, there were only 10% of Soviet students. There was 10% of Soviet students. The rest were Third World students. Um, they were all, all of them were on Soviet scholarships. It was not uh, always the case for students in other universities. Some countries uh, who sent students to the Soviet Union, they paid for the scholarships. Uh, so the rate, the rate of faculty members per student was one to four. Yes? Can you say what, what those scholarships covered? So is that, because one of the stories you hear about at the, at the end of the club is some of these students getting stranded in the Soviet Union. So were, like, were, plane, were regular plane tickets home included in these scholarships? Was housing included in these scholarships? What do you mean they were on Soviet scholarships? Um, the, they received an amount of 90 rubles per month. Um, they didn't pay for, um, uh, for the rooms. Uh, they used this money for, to pay uh, the, um, uh, the restaurant, the uh, university restaurant, um, and uh, uh, for the everyday life. So, um, it was uh, it was enough to get by. Okay. Um, and it was uh, you know ninety rubles is three times the the, fellow, the regular scholarship or the Soviet students who yeah. would do a presentment. But was the assumption you would come and you would go home four years later? Yes, yes you weren't allowed to stay. No, 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 no. I mean that you would never go home in between. Like you came from Africa, you would be in Moscow for four years, and then you would go home at the end of that four years. Yes, you were obliged to take uh, the flight back home. Uh, no, I mean, did you get to go home after the first year, after the second? Would you go home for the summer oh, yes. or something yeah, like that? Yeah. Or was it like one? Okay. You could go, uh, but you had to pay your ticket uh, to find a way to pay your ticket. But most of students uh, in the summertime went to the West, and uh, mm -hmm. they were working there, um, and so they were getting some money, and they could pay them the tickets. So another particularity, specific feature of the Lumumba University was that um, although it was, uh, the, the study programs were um, overseen by the Ministry of Education, uh, it was founded and managed by, by some social so-called social organizations, non-state organizations. So they were part of uh, the administration of the university. Uh, the Soviet Solidarity Committee, uh, Union of Friendships, uh, the Trade Unions, and uh, the Committee of Youth Organization. So these are some specific features of the Lumumba University. Another one is that it recruits many students on political criteria, many students um, coming from either communist parties or from uh, or who are members of uh, um, nationalist, anti-imperialist um, organization. So, and here is a document where you see, this is a document of the Mumbai University, Strani Afriki, uh, so where do, uh, so these are scholarships for the Lumumba University, 
Kenya, for example, get 36 scholarships. It is Oginga Odinga, the leftist uh, uh, opponent to President Kenyatta. Um, in Ethiopia, it is the soft pass the embassy who knows them, some guys and give some scholarships there. Um, uh, in Cameroon, uh, Cameroon gets five scholarships. Uh, they give the scholarships to, uh, to the Union of uh, the uh, de Population de Cameroon, uh, so, Cameroon. So the scholarships goes uh, are uh, distributed with political criteria, basically. Excuse me. What was the male to female ratio? Excuse me. Male to female students. Uh, yes, it was um, um, at the moment university uh, fourteen percent uh, female students were um, made up fourteen percent of the student body. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, uh, higher than in other in compar compared to other Soviet schools but lower compared to the, the percentage of uh, uh, female students from third world countries all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, if you compare with uh, the, UNESCO, the UNESCO data. It is in the paper, I think, yeah, so this uh, the exact, I can give you the exact uh, uh, percentages. Um, other particular specific features of the Lumumba University, it is that it tries to uh, practice affirmative action. Uh, positive discrimination and to uh, bring uh, people, um, students of working class or peasant background. And uh, according to them, um, uh, to the statistics uh, gathered by uh, Soviet professors who were taking interviews of the students, um, so these were basically their uh, um, source of information. When, when new students come to the Soviet Union, they give an interview. So 57, 58% uh, were of low income from low income families compared to 35%, for example, all over Ukraine where you had many third world students. So basically, the Soviet Union was sending third world students in Ukraine. Students from Eastern Europe were more more often in the Russian Federation, RSFSR. What else about the Mumbai University? Which other specificity? It was that it was admitting students who had not accomplished secondary education. This was also part of the affirmative action. So somebody who didn't have his uh, uh, completed secondary education could go to the Lumumba University, and that's why the preparatory faculty could last up to three years. Finally, the study, the main study programs after the preparatory faculty uh, lasted one year uh, less in comparison with uh, ordinary Soviet universities. So that means that uh, medicine at Lumumba University was five years, uh, at uh, the Moscow University, uh, Mo uh, uh, Google, uh, the, the Institute, uh, Moscow Institute of Medicine, it was six years, okay? Um, studies of engineering at Lumumba University was four years, uh, at um, um, Moscow or Kiev University was five years. At the same time, Lumumba University was delivering immediately, uh, directly the master of, uh, not a bachelor, or a master, yes. Was there a year of language training in yes. the beginning? Yes, at the preparatory faculty, uh, there was language training, and uh, for those who had to um, to, um, to raise their level, there were also other um, courses. So, but they were meant to uh, to learn Russian uh, at the preparatory faculty. So, in comparison with the other schools, it is Stahanovite, let's say, more hours uh, per week and uh, shortened programs, five years for a doctor. So this is the difference also with Mumbai University. Now, the consequences of the recruitment of students with this criteria. Uh, first, many students stayed very long at the preparatory faculty. Second, uh, students who came through political parties were not necessarily very easy, uh, um, a very easy, very easy student body. Uh, to there were many troublemakers, nationalists, uh, uh, Maoists, um, 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 many dissidents who, and there was unrest and disillusionment. Uh, there was a high dropout rate, 14%, which if you add this dropout rate to the students who stayed at the preparatory faculty, which was 30%, you had fewer graduates over time. Fewer graduates. This was a real problem, because the university was, after all, uh, I'm finishing, it meant to educate people who would quickly return to the country and would eventually um, work for uh, the building of social. Yes. 
So when you say fewer, yeah. you mean as compared to students from the third world in other Soviet institutions? As compared to enrollment. They had an enrollment of 600 students per year. So over five or six years, uh, there should have been 600 graduates. It was not the case. You had uh, uh, 350 graduates. So the investment was lost. Uh, so the, the Soviets paid for this. It was a school, uh, it was a very costly school because of the radio, because of that all the expenses were paid by the Soviet government. Um, uh, the cost of the Lumumba University was twice as much as the cost of another university. Um, there are exact data of how many millions of rubles uh, it costed. So you had fewer graduates over time, and you had many tensions with foreign government. We didn't like, we didn't like that uh, uh, the Soviets bring uh, dissident students uh, or, or, or <coughs> opponents of their policies. So this was a problem, a real problem. So the reactions very quickly. Uh, so the same uh, slide. So which are the reactions against the university? First, you have reactions of many African students who. Uh, say that uh, it is a university that segregates, it's a colonial school. See, for example, the reaction of the National Union of uh, South African Students, a letter they addressed to the Soviet Union. It was a white uh, organization, but a progressive, liberal, anti-apartheid, uh, and with many leftists. Anyway, it was, uh, it's a complicated story. But the reaction is very interesting. So bad has the situation now become that the government of the USSR has left it, has felt it necessary to segregate the non-whites from the whites, placing them to a separate university institution altogether. To disguise this discriminatory practice, the government has hypocritically indicated that the university has been created as a special gesture to the non-white peoples of the world and has gone so far as to call it the University of Friendship of Peoples. We want to know why it would be necessary to put students into separate institutions, thus depriving them of contact with the people of the country which they are visiting, where they are only to meet their own kind, in order to further this so-called friendship. We believe that this university will serve only as an indoctrination center for the ideology which your government holds, depriving the visiting people of any knowledge of the conditions obtaining both inside and outside other countries, uh, uh, the other universities in the USSR and in no way furthering the pursuit of truth and international peace and social justice. So this was the reaction of uh, the National Union of South African Students. And you have quite a few reactions of this, uh, with this content. So why do you create a separate university? We don't like it. We don't want to be in a separate university. I mean, we had this uh, in the colonial times. Of course, there was a, 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 a reply of the Soviets uh, who argued that it's not a, we didn't create this to segregate you. At the same time, there are thousands of students uh, all over the Soviet Union. It, it was right. I mean, uh, it was, in no case, it was a school created to segregate. Uh, it was created to, um, as a cultural policy. That's uh, something that would uh, elicit the gratitude of the South. There are also Arab reactions against the Lumumba University. They are different. Um, so Arabs, they don't like, of course, that the Soviets uh, uh, invite students uh, uh, not through the government and communist students, etc. But they don't like that there are also many black Africans. Huh? Iraqi officials call, call the university a party school in which study only ill-educated Negroes. Tunisian officials consider that it is a kind of discrimination against Tunisian students because young Tunisians have an educational level comparable to the European students, while the university is appropriate to African students uh, whose level is lower. And the, the, Morocco, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Morocco had also similar arguments. So it's not only a reaction against, uh, uh, um, against the, the identity of the university, that is a third world university, it's also that you know, we Tunisians we have to be in a university together with Europeans, not with Africans and Latin Americans. So you have these hierarchies also. Further reactions and measures. Many governments address uh, verbal notes, diplomatic notes, and they protest to the Soviets. Uh, you have very serious conflicts. Uh, and the, the, leader, the, the president of Algeria goes to the Soviet Union and he gives a list with the names of students. I want you to send them back. 
immediately the, uh, with this university, the Soviets were landed into troubles, political troubles. So other countries tried to prevent the students from leaving the country. A document I quote here. On August 21, four students from Benin who were ready to leave for Moscow to study at the People's Friends University, Patrice Lumumba, were arrested by the police five minutes before the plane takeoff. Other consequences. Um, students of Lumumba University ask to be transferred to other universities. I want to be to Moscow State University, not if you, I don't want to stay at Lumumba University. Um, and there are also graduates who return back and they are sent to prison. But this is not only a case with graduates of Lumumba University, also from other Soviet universities. But the, uh, the, the, the most uh, uh, important measure that uh, third world governments took against the Lumumba University was to not to recognize a degree. It was very simple, but it happened. Um, so students who got a degree, uh, their diploma from uh, Lumumba University, returned often to their countries, and they had trouble uh, accrediting the, the degree, recognizing the degree. Uh, and the third world countries evoked many, many reasons. They said that the study programs are shortened. Uh, the recruitment criteria and the methods of the university uh, do not comply with the requirements, the academic requirements, uh, the identity, the third world identity of the school, etc., etc. There were many good reasons. Of course, uh, there were political considerations. They believed that also that uh, students are trained at this university are uh, indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. A second consequence was that in some countries, it was recognized but as a bachelor instead of a master. Not as a master, which was uh, not very bad after all. Okay. Now, the Soviets had had to respond to all, all these uh, troubles of the 1960s and the early 70s. So they realized that uh, uh, the university doesn't work very well. There are serious problems. The rector, Rumyantsev, addressed a letter to the Ministry of Education in 1968. He mentioned all these problems. And he, he said to the minister, Yutin, that, look, my idea is that uh, the university delivers first a bachelor after the completion of the third year, and then fourth year, uh, fourth year of medicine, and then later the master. So basically, he proposed, uh, he, he, he had in mind that the only problem is that the, 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 excuse me, the degree is recognized as, uh, as a bachelor and not as a master. So let's give a bachelor first at the third year, and eventually, uh, finish the studies at the third year, uh, make them even shorter. So this was the solution uh, of the rector, of uh, Rumyantsev. But the ministry didn't like the solution, and uh, the rector was dismissed. So the story goes on. And there is an, a new rector, Vladimir Stanis, who took over in December 1970. He went uh, to Lumumba University, he, he was, uh, before he was minister, uh, deputy minister of uh, education of the Soviet Union. He, and he wrote a report. I found this report in the archives of Lumumba University and then the response of the ministry. So in his report, he argued that first, we have to adjust the length of studies to the Soviet standards. So Lumumba University should not, no more be an exception. Then we have to select qualified candidates who accomplished secondary, complete secondary education, uh, to work more closely with foreign communist parties and governments for the selection of students and for the recognition of the degrees, to increase the number of Soviets um, from 25 to 50 percent, because from 10 percent at the beginning, then it went to 25. He argues that for two foreign students, there should be one Soviet, not less. And also, he says that um, students have to do training in hospitals, factories, enterprises, because earlier it was not uh, systematic. He proclaimed also the cult of knowledge. In brief, so uh, his uh, propositions are accepted by the Ministry of Education. And they are implemented uh, in, the mid, in the early, uh, in 1972-73. So the first period, um, of existence of the Lumumba University from the 60s to the early 1970s. It's a period which we can um, 
characterize as the experimental one, a period of uh, political illusions and disillusions. While from the mid-1970s to, uh, to 1982, uh, there are many uh, academic improvements, uh, and it is the period of uh, the coming of age of the university. It is a very different uh, university in the, in the 70s and in the 80s than in the 60s. So the academic level is much higher. Um, the students are, you, have, you no more have uh, uh, students who don't have, have no complete secondary education. You still have, of course, members of communist parties. You see, they still try to recruit on uh, social criteria. Um, but the study programs are the same than in all other Soviet universities. Um, so basically, from the 70s onwards, the Lumumba University has no reason to exist. It is like a normal, uh, a regular Soviet university. It is a retreat from the ideas of, the, of Khrushchev. Uh, it is abandoned completely. So it, it, it is a university uh, with more or less the same study programs as uh, um, Moscow State University and all other universities. Let me go very quickly so that I leave time for discussion to the period after 1989. This finishes in 89. Uh, they introduce fees. Um, in 1991, this is very interesting, the university um, signed an agreement with the Russian government, the Commission for the Social and Economic Development of Autonomous Regions and Small Peoples of uh, the Russian Federation so that students from the Caucasus um, and from regions of uh, Russia first, and then also from uh, several, uh, from the SN SNG also, the uh, community of independent uh, uh, states, um, so that the university becomes a kind of a base for these students. Uh, so they reproduce the same model they had for the third war, now for uh, for the small peoples of, uh, uh, of uh, the Russian Federation and for the post-Soviet countries. Uh, it, until today, you have many students uh, from the regions who study at Lumumba University. Um, there was a dramatic decline of the academic level. Uh, and the, the, the tragic event was uh, in 2003 when uh, 43 students, African and Asian, died uh, when a fire broke out in, uh, in a dormitory, if you remember. It was one of the dormitories that was built by students. Because students who studied at the Faculty of Engineering were working, they were doing the training there in these dormitories, and it was a tragic event. And since the mid-1970s, there are more scholarships and more Russian and more foreign students at Lumumba University. It's a university that follows the trends of the market, so it is a different story. A very international university. Now, I assess the university, uh, I'm concluding. So, assessing the Lumumba University as an education institution. So, as I argued, uh, in the 60s it had many shortcomings. Uh, nevertheless, it was not a bad university. Uh, there, were, uh, there is concrete evidence that it was, uh, there was a, a serious academic work that was taking place there. Even the CIA, and there are many reports like this one, um, wrote in 1968, when the university was still in, uh, in trouble, that several graduates of Patrick Lumumba University have been awarded advanced degrees uh, in the United States, and Western businessmen who have worked with African graduates of Soviet schools uh, have commented favorably on their performance. The Soviet ambassador in the Netherlands finds graduates uh, of Lumumba University who were not uh, accepted to, to work in their country because they came from the Soviet Union, but they work in the Netherlands. People work, they, they, they are qualified, even though the, the study programs were shorter, even though the, uh, the criteria of recruitment were not very good. Of course, it was also a, golden, a, a better period for, the, uh, for educated um, um, people. Um, and after 1972-73, I, I can conclude that it is a good school. It's a very good school. It, it has nothing to do with uh, 
what happens today in several countries, even in Russia, these uh, diploma meals or degree meals uh, where they, um, they give the, the degrees to everybody. Um, now, let me assess the Lumumba University as a symbol or as an undertaking of cultural policy. Uh, in this respect, I will, argue, I will conclude that it failed. Uh, it did not elicit gratefulness of the Third World. It provoked reactions. It was tantamount to nasty Soviet policies. It did not become a symbol of solidarity. It was considered as a bad school, even though it was not, I said. It casted a shadow over the entire Soviet educational aid because you know, they thought that uh, um, what happens in the Soviet Union with students is what happens at Lumumba University. So they were suspicious of the intentions. And this was much uh, created by the Lumumba University. So I argue that it damaged the Soviet international cultural policies. It became a liability for the Soviet Union, the Mumbai University. It gave the opponents of the USSR handles to disparage the Soviet aid. And there was no need to create this separate university. And the experiment, in fact, was almost abandoned in 1970 to 73. Finally, the Soviets fell into the trap which Lozier and Fischer uh, had barely avoided thanks to the reactions of Africans and Frenchmen in Dakar and Abidjan. So what the French didn't do, the Soviets did it. This is a conclusion. And this is something I added for Yanis especially. <laughs> it is in Greek, <laughs> but there is a translation. Uh, it is a, a debate among Greek Cypriots. There were many Greek Cypriots. <laughs> so we will not allow them, the left, to transform the University of Cyprus to Lumumba University. So, Lumumba University is until today um, tantamount to something uh, not very academic, uh, very political, but so um, this is a legacy of uh, um, these specificities of the university. This, uh, this, is not, this you can read not only in Greek Cypriot newspapers. Uh, it didn't left a, a good reputation as a school, unfortunately. So that's why I argued in the conclusion that uh, as a cultural policy, uh, it failed. And uh, finally, and I conclude with this, about KGB spies. So did the university train KGB spies? I left the uh, best for the end. <laughs> well, you will be disappointed. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, I will show you a document from the KGB of uh, Ukraine. So if you read here carefully, there were 22 foreign students uh, uh, who were selected to do some KGB work, Zagranitsi, uh, to return to their countries and do some work of spy um, uh, for the KGB. Um, so with this, I, I would like to say that this happened in the Soviet Union. You see the document here that some students were recruited by the KGB. But this, did not, this could not happen only at Lumumba University. So I cannot give you an answer on this topic uh, directly uh, uh, through the archives of Lumumba University because they are closed. Uh, but in Kiev, I found this document. I thought it's uh, interesting to show you. Um, so that, yes, it happened. But it happened all over the USSR. Probably it happened also at Lumumba University. Okay. So I, like, I, I finish with this comment. Thank you. Thank you. It's no more called Lumumba University. It's Russian uh, People's French University. Right. It's Lumumba. Uh, and the students, the, where are they recruiting the students now? Um, they recruit them. Um, uh, there are many students from uh, African and Asian countries. Um, there was a decline of African, Asian, and Latin American students. Latin Americans are really few in now, not nowadays in, in Russia. Uh, more students come from um, uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, from uh, the for, for, uh, post-Soviet countries. And there, were, there are many Russians as well. So Alexei Navalny, for example, studied at Mumbai University <laughs> in, in the 90s. That's why he 
for if you have these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I also, if I could just add another comment. When I was on an exchange in 81, 82, I was delicately asked if I would like to write reports on what I saw there. So it wasn't only at Patrice of the University that that happened. Well, who, asked you, who asked you to write reports? I will not say. <laughs> you winning Saints where? Um, when I was in 81, 82, I was in, in Leningrad. And I mean, I know yeah, and I was asked asking. if I would like to write reports on, yeah, for the CIA. Sergei Plochi was at the Mumbai University at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the fact that uh, those networks are still operative and mm -hmm. students uh, from Africa, Asia, Latin America, you know, still, still keep applying and coming, you know, even if we reduce numbers, maybe suggestive that, you know, the reputation the university enjoys is abroad is not so mm -hmm. terrible if, you know, people from these countries are still willing mm -hmm. to pay to come maybe in, in reduced numbers, but the question I had, mm -hmm. uh, you, you really had to do with the setting of the story, of your story, you know, with the mm -hmm. international educational debates yes. in, immediately in the context of decolonization, you know, it's a wonderful setting. I was wondering uh, whether um, you found traces of another possible genealogy, namely the Soviet experience of educating uh, students from the colonial world in the 20s and 30s, and I mean, you know, the famous school, the very mm -hmm. university uh, for, for the toilets of the East, sure. it's been off Sun Yat-sen University, and mm -hmm. the University of Nats mm -hmm. uh, and uh, around, you know, in the official discourses surrounding the founding of Patrice Lumumba, did you find any references to that earlier Soviet experience? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, the reference is uh, the Rabotsky Fakulteti. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the president, the immediate president of Patrice Lumumba University are not the communal schools, they are political schools. Uh, at Sun Yat-sen, they do not study medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They study yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Marxism. Ah, and, and uh, so you could not become an engineer. Mm -hmm. You could study political economy. So these were schools for political cadres. Yes. This school exists in the 60s. Uh, it is the Institute of the Social Sciences of the Party. It is the school of the consul and it is the school of the trade unions. So you have this kind of schools. But this story is different. It is a, 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 a normal educational cooperation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I compared it directly uh, with what happens in France, in West Germany, in the US. Not with, I, I believe that this is a false comparison. Mm -hmm. And maybe, mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, maybe mm -hmm. uh, this is precisely the reason why any references to these early political schools mm -hmm. were so studiously avoided, because uh, Patrice Lumumba wanted to legitimate itself as a, as a regular university, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't even uh, have, I think, I believe, they did not teach TM up there, you know, the dialectical materialism classes, you know, that... No more in the Soviet Union. Until 68, it was, um, uh, it was not compulsory for foreign students. Yeah. They, were there, they, they, they were free to choose if they study Marxist Lenin's or not. So it became uh, compulsory in 1968, in October 1968, and at Lumumba University also. Mm -hmm. They studied Marxist Leninism. But, and this is a report which I cite in the paper, um, apparently um, the focus of the university was not on Marxism and Leninism, and the Gasudasmini Committee, which controlled the students, which passed the exams, they, they wrote a report where they said, okay, the students are good in medicine, they are good in engineering, but they don't have the level, uh, the appropriate level of political, uh, of, of philosophy, political philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just, can you repeat again what you think is the false comparison? Because I'm looking at that table and I wonder if you had African students who went to China during that time period too, if that would mm -hmm. elucidate something. Um, mm -hmm. And even in the, cause in the present moment, it's, so this is, of course, I understand it shifted, but you know, in the mid 2000s, I was studying in China. Um, African students would tell me like it's between Russia and China for me. Like many, you know, many students felt like those were the two options. Mm -hmm. They're just in terms of um, 
I guess, speed of here and back, the types of scholarships that were offered, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's more the contemporary moment. But um, yeah, there were students going. It wasn't just for political school. There are many people going to be trained in, like, you know, engineering and things like that in China. So. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, uh, they went there to study medicine, right. Chinese medicine. Well, not uh, just Chinese. Not only, yes, and other um, uh, type of uh, studies, of course. Uh, but there were a few students in China in the 60s, you mean for the 60s? Yeah. Yes. I, I don't know how many, uh, do you know, do you have any numbers of students? Um, I think that statistics are possible to find, yeah. I mean, I could go look back, sorry. Okay. Um, I can even pull up a paper, I'm sure mm. people have been writing, have mm. written about this and see mm. what data they're using for that. Mm. But yeah, they certainly weren't just going to do Chinese med like for the Tanzan Railway, for instance, many, many African students came went to China. For the Tanzan. Yeah, the Tanzan Zambia Railway. Just yes. as an example. Yes. Many, many students went to learn how to become railroad engineers. Uh, students uh, um, academic students or trainees? Uh, to, like, be, to work there for the, uh, for the project. Yeah, well, I well, think I'm not I don't sure include if they were these. offering bachelor degree. I have to go look. I mean, I haven't read anything, but okay. I do. it is possible bachelor degrees were offered mm -hmm. then as well, and not just like six month training program. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that there were African students in the early 60s, then they left China, uh, but of course, uh, people uh, continue to go to China for uh, job training for the Tanzam uh, project and for other purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I have two questions that have a role to do with China and technology. So firstly, so why, like, why, I mean, you kind of talk about the founding of Kutu Sonoma as a separate institution, but do you have any sense of, like, why the Ministry of Education decided to do it, or what Chris Jobs' own decision-making was, or even, have they decided to do it before he announced it, right? I mean, even that kind of question. Just uh, why, like, how was the decision made to found a separate institution, and sort of when, do you, do you know when that was decided, sort of how soon before? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, so on this chart, like, there's a massive uptake of students from, like, 1980, basically, onwards. Mm -hmm. And so in your talk, you kind of talk about, like, the 60s is kind of like, it's like the, the enthusiasm and like the new idea that then sort of fades and fails in like 60, 72, 73 when it becomes a normal school. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's almost like the bo the bulk of students comes like in 1980 onwards. Mm -hmm. But then the idea is like from 1960. So kind of, like, yeah, well, like, can you comment on, on like on that as a chronology? Yes. Well, the, univer the Lumumba University did not follow the trend. Indeed, uh, these are these are African students uh, uh, all over the Soviet Union, not only at the Mumbai University. Yeah, right. So, like, I mean, as a as a policy, as an educational policy. Yes. Kind of the, the volume goes up as the symbol fails. Like, what does that say? Yes, um, it's a very good question. Well, um, the Soviet Union, the, the the countries of Africa and Asia were not against uh, uh, the Soviet scholarships. They wanted. Uh, uh, free education for their citizens. So the more the Soviet unions could offer scholarships, they were getting them. But they said that we will choose the students, we will select the persons, uh, there will be a state board committee that will choose the students and we will send them to the Soviet Union. And then you educate them, you pay the scholarships, we are very glad. And they will return back. So this would be an inter bilateral intergovernmental agreement. And this was a state-to-state -state cooperation. Uh, which indeed uh, uh, was extremely important in the 70s and in the 80s. Um, so Lumumba did not work in the same way. Lumumba tried to recruit its students basically uh, through political parties. And this is something that he didn't like. It's uh, a different not like, who did not like? Uh, the, the foreign countries, the foreign governments. When the Algerian government see that Lumumba University recruits Algerian <coughs> communists, and not members of the Nationalist Party, uh, so um, they don't like this. So Algerians are very glad to send students uh, to the Moscow Energy Institute, to the Kiev uh, Polytechnical School, to the Lvov uh, Medical Institute. They're very glad, but not at the Mumbai University. Um, and the other question was why they created the university. Yes. 
I have two answers. Uh, that's why I started with the French, because it was an idea, uh, widespread, a widespread idea at that time, that uh, now it is the moment to create schools to educate them quickly, because um, this is the right thing to do in order to have political influence over these countries. We will educate them, we will put them in their mind the right ideas, and we will create a friendship with those guys, and we will then develop our um, relations, economic relations, political relations, etc. So this was one idea behind the creation of the Mumbai University. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I think that it was they believe that it is a good, it is a good cultural policy. It is a good investment in cultural. Big powers invest in cultural policies uh, to, to have a good image abroad. So the Soviets believe that with the Mumbai University they are doing the right things. Well, I think that uh, they didn't. <laughs> yes, you have a question. Yes. I was really curious when you mentioned that in the summers, yes. students at Lumumba typically went to the West. Yes. Could you comment more on that phenomenon and its impact on the educational mission of Lumumba and, and foreign government's perceptions of the university? Yes, of course. Not all students went to the West. Uh, there are, I, I, uh, there are some percentages we can see uh, uh, for students from all over the Soviet Union, how many of them go to the West, not only in the summer, also in, in, in the Christmas holidays, so they went to the West. Uh, um, uh, so yes, they went, they work there, they bring uh, back uh, um, clothes, uh, they sell them, so Maxim has written a lot <laughs> about his uh, habits of uh, foreign students. Uh, yes, they bring, um, um, so they, they, they cross the borders and they connect uh, the, the East with the West. So Wait, so when you yeah. say West, do you mean France or do you mean, because you know, like Jonathan Batlin has written a lot about African students, Vietnamese students in particular, and the GDR, and yes. where, yes, where exactly are they going? Um, students from the former French Empire go to France, students uh -huh. from the former, okay. uh, from Somalia go to Italy. Those from to, to, to the former so metro. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. There are these layers yeah. of the colonial. Yeah. 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 Sweden, Sweden became a very popular destination at some point. Sweden. Sweden, yes, yeah. yes, for Latin Americans yeah. especially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yes. Sure, <laughs> yes. uh, <anyway. laughs> cold. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows Latin Americans love the snow. And it is that uh, the passports of the students at the Mumbai University were seized in, in the early 60s. But this stopped in '66, if I remember well. Yeah. So it was not easy to go for the students of, of Lumumba University. For the others, it was easier. So this, the Soviet project is—I just want to be—the Soviet project is, is like a stepping stone out. Is what's happening. Yes, they didn't like it. Okay. They didn't like it at all. Um, they tried to convince them to stay uh, in the Soviet Union during their holidays. Uh, in, 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 you know, things. It was the kind of thing. Thank you very much for this talk. I was interested, I'm, I want to know more about a comparison with um, uh, Western European students or Western students, uh, first world students studying in the Soviet Union. Are, they, are there similar programs and how much money is being invested in these kinds of programs? Because uh, what I'm interested in is um, I studied performing arts, cultural policy at this time, and the Soviets talk a lot about investing money and sending cultural um, projects to Africa, to Asia, but then they actually don't do it. it all their cultural ties, or a huge portion of it is with Western Europe and the US. Yes. Um, so I'm interested that they're actually following up to some degree and investing money in, the, in this policy with Africa. So is, is that the case that they're putting a lot more money in this than they are in money, money in projects with the, with the US and Western Europe? Uh, in, in the field of education, yeah. uh, uh, in educating students, yes, they, they, they offer scholarships to students from the third world. They don't offer uh, many scholarships to students uh, um, from France or from West Germany. So of course they give some scholarships to common students, uh, but not that many. Uh, the Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union, of course, prefer to have contacts with the West and to have projects with the West, uh, because from the West they could uh, uh, learn more, uh, but uh, when it goes to um, uh, when it comes to uh, to transferring our knowledge to somebody who is considered inferior, uh, so this was the third world. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I, I heard this bizarre Soviet anecdote about the founding of Patrice Lund University that had to do with Khrushchev's visit to the United States. And, and, he, and he was asked, do you have universities like this in Russia? And he picked up the phone and said, uh, make a <laughs> university. Uh -huh. And that was, I mean, it, it's a very bizarre story, but uh -huh. I did hear it. Is it does that <laughs> ring any bells? Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, I have no, I have no point <laughs> in that. So yeah. Let's uh, pretend it's good. It's good. Let's <laughs> pretend. Yeah, I, just, I mean, you know, I really prefer your version of it. Rob, Robin has been waiting patiently. No, no, I, this is all really interesting. Thank you for your presentation. And um, so I'm a little bit confused, though. Did the Soviets want to project the idea that this was not a political education? Because I'm hearing you say that it is clearly has some political motivations. I mean, the fact that they choose Patrice Lumumba as the name in and of itself suggests, suggests a certain kind of alliance with a particular kind of radical decolonization mm -hmm. that not everyone who accepts Soviet assistance in Africa aligns with, for one. They're recruiting directly from communist political parties in Africa, which are unevenly spread at the time. Um, so I'm one, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that there were obviously clear political motivations mm -hmm. But what was the image they were trying to project to different African countries? Because my understanding on the ground, if you look at different you know, African countries that were sending people to different universities in the Soviet Union at this time, they were often saying, this is strictly for technical education. Mm -hmm. And we're strictly accepting scholarships for technical education. Mm -hmm. And we're only going to accept Soviet missions within our countries if it's for technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So explicitly not for degrees. And, Poli sci and history and Marxism. <laughs> for example, <laughs> and they were they were able both and both parties were able to use that discourse. I think some of it was quite genuine, but as a certain kind of protective measure against this isn't just about an explicit political. So I'm wondering, how, you know, how the Soviets that were running this university projected and promoted it. Mm -hmm. Were they saying this was a non-political technical education, or were they explicit in the political goals of this? A very good question. Well, uh, they never said that uh, this is uh, a university that has uh, that, uh, the aim is uh, that aims to uh, to change your political ideas and to convince you to become <coughs> communist. No, they never said. Okay. That. But they said this is a, a normal university. Uh, it is uh, a school that we create out of solidarity for okay. you uh, who have been oppressed by Western colonialism and. Uh, uh, we will help you uh, to develop your country uh, as a good patriot, anti-imperialist, uh, against the former colonizers, and we will... Well, that uh, language obviously was, was quite political. I mean, to say that this, you know, as kind of an anti, I don't know. So, so mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they're saying we're not... I mean, would your interpretation be that this was yeah. a very political, you know... It was a I mean, I'm just wondering where you would come down on that, you know, versus other universities or other technical exchanges that weren't always yes. using that language necessarily. Yes. So I mean, this is the language of Lozier and Fisher at the same time that Yes, uh, Africa needs its own intellectual and scientific and technical experts capable to assume the responsibility of their countries and destinies as quickly as possible. Consumption is the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was a, a something um, that was, of course, uh, on the top of uh, the agenda. Um, of African countries, Asian countries, that uh, uh, we need to educate people. So um, you cannot um, uh, uh, label these discourse only as leftist, or it can be a patriotic discourse, it can be um, a discourse of uh, even of conservative uh, countries. So we want to develop our country, uh, but uh, with a conservative uh, culture otherwise. But we won't develop, we want modernization and development. Uh, economic development, basically. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question, but yeah, well, I, don't, I guess I don't know quite what my question is because I'm, I'm. It sounds like other universities, though. I'm trying to get a sense of the broader context, mm -hmm. like within within the Soviet Union at the time. Like other universities were maybe using a different language or a different set of partnerships, or I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I mean, there were presidents welcoming Soviet experts into their country saying, it's totally fine if you're here to do mineral mapping or to teach us engineering, but the minute you start talking about Marxist, Leninist, political mm -hmm. anything, you're out of here. 
you know, and I'm, and they would sometimes send students abroad like under the similar prescription. And if they felt that that had not been held up, they would be like mm -hmm. redoublement, like on in mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. or you know, nettoyage de cerveau was like another weird phrase that was used. You know, like mm -hmm. clean your brain out and send you back mm -hmm. to France. So I'm just like, there seemed to be this fine line, but this university seemed to be more explicit and mm -hmm. just being like. It was not explicit. It, it was explicit. never stated okay. explicit. So that, that be the uh, we will. Uh, okay. This po this university has also a political and ideological mission. It had this mission, the university, okay. uh, but it was uh, uh, it was not stated explicitly. Okay. Well, didn't MBU have that mission explicitly? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the mission of all? No. The university education? wanted to to indoctrinate. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, there, there was a book. Uh, about how to indoctrinate students, a book of uh, 200 pages uh, written mm -hmm. by professors, uh, what you have to do clearly to indoctrinate the students and uh, to convince them. Uh, not overtly, mm -hmm. uh, because we know that uh, uh, foreign countries don't like it. Uh, and uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, for example, in 1959, uh, ordered the, um, the transfer of 200 students from Egypt to the, Soviet, to the United States immediately, because he realized that there was indoctrination. And the Soviets knew it. They knew that uh, the third world is afraid of uh, communism, so that's why it was optional. The courses uh, that were uh, compulsory for all Soviet and Cuban and Eastern Euro East European students, for third world students were optional in the Soviet Union until, 19, uh, until the 70s, mm -hmm. 1968. Okay. So, and it, it became uh, compulsory at that moment. There are reasons why it became compulsory. Um, uh, there was a debate in the ministry. Uh, there were reactions, but they swallowed the bitter pill because they, I, don't, I, I, I think that some countries were not afraid anymore. They didn't want to lose the scholarships. Well, so to put it another way, so, so what you're saying is that by the end of this, they are doing Marxism, Leninism, they are doing this as required courses, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But another way to phrase the same question is that if, if you are studying the Soviet Union, um, the Soviet Union is socialist. Uh, I mean, the entire project is socialism. Mm -hmm. um, how could you not be indoctrinated? I mean, the whole the whole point of the place is to show that socialism can do these things. Um, so, you know, if you pose the same question but slightly differently, mm -hmm. it is a showcase and it is a way to train people who would be friendly to the Soviet Union and perhaps carry the model back to where they were, be it stage one decolonization or stage two building socialism, mm -hmm. which is why you can have both Nasser there and um, the, the, the Congolese. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is that so? Yes. Another model would be to set up institutions on these territories themselves, right? Like the point is explicitly to bring them to the mothership, mm -hmm. as it were. <laughs> so they, they were very optimistic, the Soviets, that uh, by bringing uh, the young students here, um, uh, they will become friends of the Soviet Union. Know, this is the task, this is our task. They knew that it was uh, not automatic, uh, but they wanted to achieve this. And um, over time, they believe that uh, this friendship uh, will pay back, this investment will pay back. And of course, that many people uh, would, uh, would be politically influenced uh, um, by the sole fact that they were in the Soviet Union, uh, they spent uh, uh, time uh, at Soviet universities, in, uh, uh, with the Komsomol, in uh, cultural activities and things like that. And there were many students that, uh, uh, that they liked these ideas. So uh, it's a different story then. Uh, it, did the students uh, educated in the Soviet Union um, uh, return communists or they return anti communists? So uh, it's a very big story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We can debate it if you wish. Uh, who, who is next? Yes. Uh, so, okay. um, so you mentioned that uh, over time, um, uh, university began to admit more Soviet students. Uh, can we come up with a profile of a Soviet student who would be admitted at an institution like this one? Uh, what were the restrictions laid? Because it's, it's a very unusual institution. Mm -hmm. uh, Soviet students would be placed in proximity to a large number of foreign students. Uh -huh. uh, would they have to be reliable? Uh, would they accept Jews, for example? Things like that. The nationalities. I have a table with the nationalities of Soviet students. Uh, well, they, they were from all over the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So they accepted every, everyone. <coughs> uh, but the majority were Russians. Would, be they mostly, uh, would they be mostly from the pro uh, provinces? Or no, no, they were Russians. I mean, from Moscow, Leningrad? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this had to do also with the fact that uh, well, no, students were um, uh, living with um, um, uh, in the same rooms with uh, the foreigners, so uh, they needed the room. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, the 90 percent, the overwhelming, or the 80 80 percent, the overwhelming majority were were from the RSF mm -hmm. um, and the profile. Um, the percentage is something like 35 percent members of the Communist Party or candidates. Mm -hmm. The rest uh, consul and one percent without the party. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have evidence that in the 60s, uh, the Soviet students uh, were not very good students. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a kind of recruiting people from the army. Uh, mm -hmm. So th the same with the third world students. So give the chance to people who have not completed secondary education. And there was a, a big dropout, dropout rate of Soviets as well. But uh, later you have better students, and the profile also. These are students who want to study Orientalism very often, uh, who want to. Uh, it was the only university in the Soviet Union where a Soviet student could uh, defend his thesis in English. Mm -hmm. Online university, oh. you could defend your thesis in English. Yes, and, and there was some uh, somebody was translating for the committee because the committee was, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes. So. E you had to be, you know, motivated to learn uh, about Asian and African cultures. You wanted to work in the cultural media, or in the ministry of, or in the embassy, or in the SSOD, or OD, um, to go there. So this was a primary motivation to become an Orientalist. Yes. Um, maybe just to address Maxim's question, and you kind of already suggested the answer. And I do think these figures that you suggested of party membership and consumer membership are much higher at Lumumba for Russian students at Lumumba University mm -hmm. than for Russian students mm -hmm. anywhere else because you know that was precisely you know the purpose of uh, you know having these dorm rooms with three uh, three foreigners and one one Russian or Soviet student you know so that some surveillance could could take place you know at the level of the consumer a consumer mm -hmm. committee, uh, and then hence you know the reputation which uh, Russia, you know Soviet Lumumba universities enjoyed then. I don't know whether it's still true, you know, more loyal mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether you know they there was a preparatory faculty. I, I don't remember whether there was a preparatory faculty for Soviet students so that they could uh, learn foreign languages. I think that's yes. something that may have distinguished uh, the also the experience of Soviet students at, at Patrice Lumumba from, from other. Uh, but, um, um, sorry, just one, uh, uh, you know, very small comment on, on this early debate, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do think also the, um, you know, as, as Yanni pointed out, you know, Patrice Lumumba was a showcase, but because it had to be showcased to such vastly different audiences, uh, mm -hmm. You know, from the different third world governments, you know, with different degrees of sympathy to the Soviet project, you know, from Syria and Yemen, Ethiopia on the one hand, you know, uh, socialist, uh, socialist states to, you know, uh, you know proclaim socialist states to, to states really very suspicious of. Mm -hmm. And so, so in each case, the reaction was very different. You know, there were so many other different audiences in addition to governments that uh, the university had to be, uh, you know, described and shown to. So, uh, so I'm sure there are so many mm -hmm. <laughs> different sure. possibilities and narratives. But uh, I'm sorry, I really meant to ask a question which was, uh, which had to do with, uh, um, you know, what to me was uh, maybe the most um, you know, interesting perspective I found on um, on foreign students, uh, on third world students in the Soviet Union, and that's in uh, Julie Hetler's article, mm -hmm. you know, in which 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 ends with this assertion that uh, they enjoyed an immense, uh, you know, at least a great deal of freedom, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, counter these. Uh, debates, you know, were these students indoctrinated or did they come out anti-communist? Uh, you know, 
the Hitlers, uh, the, the, they, they enjoyed the great deal more freedom than regular mm -hmm. Soviet students and, and actually expressed it and uh, often spoke in, in classrooms in a way that uh, mm -hmm. you know, so regular Soviet students would not dare to because they were prestige mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. objects, you know, they could not be uh, disciplined and, and dismissed as, uh, mm -hmm. as regular Soviet students. So I'm just wondering whether in your study of Patrice Lumumba you, you found you know, any evidence for Julius hypothesis, which is obviously not, not done on specifically mm -hmm. on Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I definitely agree that they enjoyed um, uh, a very free uh, life in the Soviet Union. You see this first from how they travel and also in their political uh, unions. The best example is probably the, uh, the Federation of African Students in the Soviet Union, which was the biggest, the big union of African students. Uh, when they had a congress, it was a congress of 300 people. Uh, three, three, excuse me, 300 people attended the congress. Um, so the doors were closed for the Soviets, uh, and uh, they were free to vote, uh, to, uh, to pass their resolutions, anti-Soviet sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, some of the Soviet the dissidents... Dissidents at the New York University, the same. Yeah, in 1968, uh, some of the Soviet dissidents uh, found an example of the African students in Moscow inspiring, you know, mm -hmm. the way they protested over mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, well, I was just thinking that uh, about this who goes, who goes where question, which students from abroad go to which universities. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when I was um, living in Moscow State University in the late 80s, there was a clear division of rights and privileges. And that was, it was either you know, communist, you know, Soviet, or you were Kapstran, capitalist mm -hmm. countries, or Sotstran, which meant you were then the socialist of the world. I mean, not Russia, but the, not mm -hmm. the USSR, but everybody else. And everybody knew that those were all those, those were the categories. And, um, and then there were tremendous variation of, of nationalities of people. But what I'm trying to figure out is for Patrice Lumumba University, um, did all um, or most uh, people from the third world go there and not to M MGU. Did this this kind of thing ch shift over time? And part of this is connected connected to questions of race. Um, how you know basically black was Patrice Lumumba University compared to the other universities? And did you have African students going to? Um, MGU or other universities at the same time that some of their peers were going to to Patrice Lumumba. Yes, okay. it's a great question. Yes, um, the university uh, with the biggest number of African students in the Soviet Union was neither Lumumba nor MGU. It was Kharkov State it University. Was Kharkov. Okay. There were concentrated. Uh, uh, the majority of African students was there. You had more Africans there than in Lumumba. Then of course you had all over the Soviet Union, and so. Only uh, in the 80s, 5% of uh, students from Sub-Saharan Africa are at Lumumba University, mm -hmm. and the rest of the 90, 95% at the end are at uh, uh, all over the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Kharkov, Kiev, uh, um, medical institutes, uh, almost everywhere. And were there economic conditions, in other words, fellowships and so on, as the same as those um, students at Moscow at Lumumba? I mean, yes. did they also get the 90 rubles? They get the 90 rubles, plus uh, those uh, at Lumumba University, um, the Latin Americans were also getting an allowance of eight dollars, not rubles, dollars, uh, for their trip back to Latin America. So there was also, uh, the conditions at Lumumba University in that respect were not bad, uh, especially when they, con they built a new um, campus uh, in the 70s, um, it was in Moscow. It was better to be at the Mumbai University. It, well, if the degree was recognized, it was better to be at the Mumbai University than uh, in somewhere, somewhere else in a small uh, city of the Soviet Union. In some respects, you were in Moscow, uh, so you had the um, the same scholarship. So let, let me follow up then. So if we took the mission, mission this mission of um, training. Um, uh, 
then really we have to say that Patrice Lumumba was only a piece of that mission, and that the Soviets were admitting and encouraging admission and training of a vast majority, a vast number of, 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 of people from the third world, you know, in addition to the Lumumba. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And how does that chronology work out in the, the admission of, yeah, these are the total numbers, yes. okay. Well, uh, when in 1988 you have 21 uh, students from Sub-Saharan Africa, only Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. I don't count Egyptians, South Syrians, uh, all over the USSR, at Lumumba University you have maximum 1,300 students, because you have 150 students per year, together with those who write a PhD. Uh, so over six years, it is, uh, I have the exact statistics, so it is something I have put in the paper uh, in the last part. So it becomes, a, so it, it has a, a, a disproportionate uh, uh, you know, reputation as a university, but it is not true. Uh, it was a marginal university at the end. A marginal in the sense that there were more students all over the Soviet Union, African students. With Latin Americans, with Latin Americans it is different. Uh, because um, um, uh, when it comes to Latin Americans in the Soviet Union, 70% are from Cuba. In the 80s you have also Nicaragua. So 85%, 80% are from these two countries. So the rest of the 10%, it is not 21,000. It is something like um, 4,000. And you have almost 2,000 at the Mumbai University. So for Latin Americans it is important. It's an important point. So other for Latin Americans other than Cubans or Nicaraguans. Mm -hmm. uh, could I ask you about the, the I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the measurement of success and how you're measuring success in all of this. So um, and you had a chart and you went through all the points that were negative and you decided it was a failure in every right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been, I wonder about the metrics, you know, about mm -hmm. the, uh, the standard of measurement. So, on the one hand, you can say, well, you know, did they get an education? Could they build a bridge? You know, could they cure a patient? You know, that kind of thing, which would be a different measurement, which actually interests me. You know, did they go home qualified? Mm -hmm. um, so that'd be one set of questions. But the other one is that what's specific about the Lumumba University is that unlike the other places, is a segregated education. So I think it's very nice to frame it that way, meaning there's a special school with segregation, which could have a positive or negative intonation. Or does it actually work and what are some of the drawbacks? And so the evidence you're presenting is saying that because they're being segregated, as uh, specifically um, well, non-European students, I guess would be what we'd, what we'd say, right? Um, that it's, um, the, that aspect of the education was part of the failure that you described, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they were segregated. Um, so again, I wonder, you know, um, you know uh, how does one reach the conclusion that it failed because mm -hmm. it was segregated? Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't these complaints, and I think I've seen your other research where like, these same complaints are being expressed everywhere mm -hmm. uh, at, all, at all the universities because they'll go as African students and live in a special upshaga, you know, special uh, mm -hmm. uh, residence hall, you know, special rooms, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, they eat separately, they have different stipends, they visit different stores, they go to all the stores, and so on and so forth. So segregation is occurring in different ways in different places. Mm -hmm. But then to push this even further, if you look at your charts here, Look at the United States. Those are sub-Saharan students, is that right? Are those sub-Saharan students? Yes, sub-Saharan students, yes. So in 1962, you know, at 3,540, they went to American universities, they were segregated by definition, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's, that's what happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I wonder about the metrics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just to ask it this way, um, segregation in the Mumbai University is not the same thing as segregation at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. right? I wonder. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. How do I measure the success or the failure? And how, That's the first how part. does the second segregation come into the picture? Yeah, the second part is, so a segregation necessarily not always a failure. Yes. Or what kind of failure is it? Because it wouldn't be the same thing as the American failure. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, uh, my idea was, uh, was not that the Uber University was uh, an institution that was segregated. So this was what people from abroad said, from students believe that it is an institution of segregation. In my eyes, it was not. Uh, it was just uh, an institution which the Soviets thought that it is what they need. This is what they need right now. It's not a matter of segregating. It is, uh, it, uh, it, it was, uh, the criteria were not uh, racial. They were developmental in their eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't believe that it was uh, um, 
well, of course, uh, it was only for federal students, but um, I, I, I don't interpret this as a segregation. Now, as regards the um, how I, do I measure the success mm -hmm. or the failure, this is a very difficult question. Um, for, for the educational part, I, my assessment was that uh, it, it succeeded. It was a success. It was not a failure. The education. Mm -hmm. How do I measure uh, in the 70s, especially in the 70s? Mm -hmm. um, I see that uh, uh, people uh, get their degrees and work. Uh, they turn, they go somewhere and they work. They find it, uh, a job. Uh, I see the report that they are working. Uh, there are reports for with 40 graduates, for example. Um, and I can see that they work. There are reports of the Soviet ambassador uh, in uh, uh, in Senegal uh, or in India uh, of the Soviet uh, consular um, representation in Kathmandu. And there is a list of graduates and what they are doing. So I can see, I can follow their careers, uh, and I can assess the university. Did it work well or not? Um, the doctors who studied at uh, Lumumba University. Um, I know that uh, those who studied in the 60s, uh, they had trouble recognizing their degree. Those later, they worked. So there are uh, um, uh, ways to measure mm -hmm. the, the academic part, the academic part of uh, the educational part of the story. Now, what I uh, I said that it was a failure. Uh, it was uh, the university failed to become the symbol of solidarity and of disinterested aid. Uh, it failed as a cultural policy, not as an educational policy. I, I believe that uh, as an education institution, it was it was good, uh, and the Soviets uh, expended ever greater efforts to improve the, the school. Uh, they poured money into the school. They built um, a, a polyclinic for the school. Uh, um, so I, I see the curricula, I see um, um, the training process, the degrees of people, and then what they are doing in their career. So that's why I, I assess the education as a success, not as a failure. And even the comments of the Americans are similar. Uh, this, the report of the CIA, yes. I want to follow up on the measure of success. Um, it might be possible to say, or I might be persuaded to agree with you that it was a cultural failure from the point of view of the Soviet political project. Mm -hmm. yes. But it wasn't a cultural. I would, I would say that another aspect of success or failure is a terrible word. Um, really, and, and a cultural one is about Russian culture. Yes. And all the um, aspects of Russian culture mm -hmm. that people fell in love with mm -hmm. when they were in, in Russia. They also fell in love with Russians, even though and Soviets and so on. But, um, but then that was sometimes a vector and a vehicle for discovering Russian literature or discovering Russian music and, and so on. And all over the world, you have people who, whether or not their degree got recognized and whether or not they are, they might be highly you know, anti-communist or uh, they might be have any kind of politics, but still deeply mm -hmm. were affected by their years uh, in, in mm -hmm. uh, Patrice Lumumba mm -hmm. in, 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 in Moscow. And, and took away with it, uh, uh, I would say, a very strong dedication to Russian culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. That's true. I, I have in, to in, in make the, a the distinction. In the hot big C sense, yeah. I would say. Yes, I have to make a distinction. Uh, it failed uh, politically, uh, yes. as a political symbol. But yes, so I think that you are absolutely right. Yeah. I'm sorry to continue on this topic, but uh, in you know, in the Cold War discursive field where, you know, each side is mm -hmm. trying to trash the other and phrase its own, it's uh, really politically difficult to measure those, uh, you know, success and failure, as, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, you do expect, uh, um, you know, you do expect various Western presses and, uh, you know, to be negative about Patrice Lumumba, you do expect, you know, some sympathetic uh, third world leftist publications, you know, to, to praise the, the, the graduates. And, uh, and ultimately, I mean, it was used, uh, you know, as a space uh, by the 
Soviet state to invite uh, to, to host quite a number, and maybe that was one of the original purposes of concentrating uh, the world's students in, in four walls. Uh, you know, was that the Soviet uh, state, you know, had one more place to showcase to visiting diplomats, delegations, look, uh, you know, <coughs> piece of material symbol of mm -hmm. our friendship, and, and it was really very heavily used in that capacity. Mm -hmm. It hosted, um, you know, True. A huge number of, of events and mm -hmm. visitors to mm -hmm. the field. So, um, yes. yeah, and, and, and mm -hmm. the fact that uh, you know it, it was used in this capacity suggests that at least in some circles it, its reputation wasn't mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. tarnished. And yes, I, I, yes, you have a point. Yes, uh, in the s 70s and in the 80s, uh, the image of the school improves significantly. Um, and the Soviets, of course, uh, invite uh, um, ambassadors. Yes, they invite the ambassadors. The ambassadors go there, they meet the Soviet uh, rector, and what a great school you have created for us, and thank you, and thank you. But when the door closes, uh, they tell him, look, uh, my friend, you don't give scholarships to the Communist Party, you give me the scholarships, mm -hmm. and I give them to the members of my party. <laughs> so, or uh, this has to be decided by a state board. I don't want you to do uh, nasty things, uh, you know. Otherwise, I don't recognize a diploma. Uh, so they were, uh, a, they had the fine, found the way to, to, to put the pressure on the Soviets, and they managed to put the pressure uh, very well. And yes, um, so one thing is what is said and written if we study only uh, the published sources and the Soviet discourse, and then if we get into the account, you know, I, I'm very afraid of using uh, words such as success and failure. I did it here for, uh, uh, because also I'm jet lagged and I thought it was to state it clearly. But honestly, you know, I have studied these stories for 10 years. <laughs> uh, I don't have other words to describe. I think I have evidence to say that, yes, they back down from what they started at the beginning. Uh, they changed the school. Uh, so, and there were reasons. I mean, even the Soviets they say they, in in their internal debates, so here we have troubles, uh, and that's why they change their policy. I cannot say that it is an unexpected consequence. Okay, it is an unexpected consequence, but well, let me state it. It was a, also a cultural failure. Also, it was probably connected to the general disillusionment with Africa. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the disillusionment with Africa. Uh, Khrushchev was yes. uh, violent and uh, he was hopeful that mm -hmm. Africa will follow in the socialist path. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the 1960s, there was mm -hmm. a disillusionment. You know, the Soviet protégés get kicked out of power in mm -hmm. Mali, Algeria, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the whole project becomes much more cynical, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the Soviet policy, the Soviet relations with Africa mm -hmm. overall. Yes, the, 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 of course, uh, after the failures uh, uh, of the 60s, uh, then uh, the policy changes. You know, it's much better than me. It changes in Nigeria when we go with the government and not with the Biafrans. Mm -hmm. It changes then, uh, uh, of course, when we support only uh, Marxist Leninist parties uh, in Angola and in Ethiopia. Uh, the policy changes, changes, changes over time, and it changes also at the Mumbai University. Mm -hmm. So the Mumbai University changes. It is different in the 60s, different in the 70s, and in the 80s. And of course, in the 90s, it's something completely different. Very good. So we'll be here for another, well, at least another 40 minutes, or if you want to use up this time, we still don't have for a little while. Yeah. Um, Hey, can I tell you a joke? Uh, in 1991, I was with a gathering. They were all drunk, right? It was Easter, uh, May 5th. Uh, I remember it was in 1991. In a town called Krivorov, which is in mm -hmm. Ukraine. They'd never celebrated Easter before. So in the middle of their drinking, they said, well, what do we say? I said, we say, Christ is risen. They said, Tavarishi. Christos <laughs> <laughs> You know, comrades, Christ is risen. They didn't see the contradiction. Mm -hmm. I think even, even so, they would have seen a contradiction. But, well, anyway, this is uh, Easter after Easter. Comrades, Christ is risen. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.